Good evening. The Mueller report is out. The good news is that it provides a detailed look at how the Russian government interfered in the 2016 election. And after an extensive investigation, Mueller's team, quote, did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in their interference. That isn't just good news for the president members of a cam his campaign. It's good news for the country. The bad news for the president is that despite his claims that he's been completely exonerated, that is just not true. The Mueller report explicitly does not clear the president of attempting to obstruct justice. In fact, it details repeated attempts by the president to interfere with the investigation, efforts to thwart a probe that the president saw as an existential threat. Reading now from a Justice Department staffer's account in the report, when Sessions told the president that a special counsel had been appointed, the president slumped back in his chair and said, oh my God, this is terrible, this is the end of my presidency, I'm effed, using a curse word. On page after page, Robert Mueller details the many ways the president tried to make it all go away, including getting rid of the special counsel. Uh, he documents orders that the president gave, such as to fire Mueller, which his subordinates did not carry out, but would have turned the White House politically radioactive. At least three people working for the president declined potentially damaging directives from the president. Sometimes they said they would do it, and just they didn't, hoping the president would forget about it, despite having the greatest uh, memory. Uh, what he had asked them to do. There's also much in Mueller's 448-page document on episodes that we and others reported on at the time, stories that the president or the administration characterized as fake news. The funny thing, when some of those same people are under oath, they confirmed the so-called fake news was real. Sarah Sanders made up facts about why Comey was fired and under oath admitted what she was uh, in, in the words of Mueller, what she said in the words of uh, Mueller, quote, wasn't founded on anything. We'll get to all of that tonight. We begin with the report's bottom line conclusions, how they compare to the attorney general's portrayal and the president's longstanding claim, which he restated today. I'm having a good day, too. It was called No Collusion, No Obstruction. <laughs> there never was, by the way, and there never will be. This should never happen to another president again. This hoax, this should never happen to another president again. Well, the president spoke just a short time after his attorney general did, with Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein standing behind him, but Robert Mueller notably absent. William Barr, ahead of the release of the report, put his gloss on that report, echoing many of the president's talking points, illegal leaks, no collusion, everything but witch hunt and hoax. Barr also advanced a novel explanation of why the president's actions did not amount to obstruction of justice. As he said from the beginning, there was, in fact, no collusion. And as the special counsel's report acknowledges, there is substantial evidence to show that the president was frustrated and angered by his sincere belief that the investigation was undermining his presidency propelled by his political opponents and fueled by illegal leaks. Nonetheless, the White House fully cooperated with the special counsel's investigation, providing unfettered access to campaign and White House documents, directing senior aides to testify freely, and asserting no privilege claims. Well, we'll leave the legal theory for our team of lawyers and former federal prosecutors to discuss. Barr's portrayal of the Mueller report in advance, and even today, has become an issue reflecting on what role he actually is playing as Attorney General of the United States for the American people or for President Trump. In Barr's March 24th letter, citing a line from the report, Barr wrote, I'm quoting now, the investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. That is true. It's what I quoted at the top of the program. But now we know the full citation, which the Attorney General had access to at the time, it's hardly that rosy. It reads, although the investigation established that the Russian government perceived it would benefit from a Trump presidency and work to secure that outcome, and that the campaign expected it would benefit electorally from information stolen and released through Russian efforts. The investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. Barr is saying in so many words, whatever happened, as unprecedented as it was, as wrong as you may consider it to be or not, it didn't add up to any chargeable crimes because the Trump campaign and the Russian government did not get together and agree on it, at least not that the available evidence showed, and the special counsel acknowledges that some of that evidence, evidence is simply not accessible. According to the special counsel, some individuals associated with the campaign deleted communications. Some refused to speak, citing the Fifth Amendment. Others, he said, flat out lied. In any case, the report certainly documents plenty of contacts with Russians. The traditional amount, by the way, is none. 
Looking at the index, it starts on page 66 with the heading Russian government links to and contacts with the Trump campaign and runs another 102 pages into the transition and finally the White House. At least 16 Trump associates had Russian contacts during the campaign or transition, according to public statements, court filings, and reports from CNN and others. Some of the Trump aides lied about these contacts and were charged with lying to investigators and glossing over all of it. Attorney General Barr suggests the president has a clean bill of health. He also mischaracterized the special counsel's reasons for not reaching a decision on obstruction, suggesting that Mr. Mueller was not relying on Justice Department guidelines that a sitting president can't be indicted. He was not saying that but for the OLC opinion, he would have found a crime. He made it clear that he had not made the determination that there was a crime. Well, that's misleading at best, as, as the attorney general should have known from reading the report, which states, and I'm quoting, given the role of the special counsel as an attorney in the Department of Justice and the framework of the special counsel's regulations, this office accepted the OLC's, the Office of Legal Counsel's, legal conclusion for the purpose of exercising prosecutorial jurisdiction. So at 9.51 a.m. Eastern Time, Attorney General Barr said one thing that would be easily checkable just an hour or so later. He also didn't mention this from the report. The special counsel writing, quote, if we had confidence after a thorough investigation of the facts that the president clearly did not commit obstruction of justice, we would so state. Based on the facts and the applicable legal standards, however, we are unable to reach that judgment. We we'll certainly talk about that tonight, and we'll also dig into what the Mueller document reveals about stories that we and others reported on that the White House at the time called fake news, despite the stories being true. One involves a report in the New York Times back in January of last year that President Trump had once asked White House counsel Don McGahn to fire Robert Mueller. Here's what the president said about it at the time. Fake news, folks. Fake news. What's your message today? Typical New York Times fake stories. It was true. <laughs> that was a lie. The Mueller report works through the entire episode step by step, day by day, as the president stews over it, tries to get Don McGahn to lie about it too, demanding he write a letter calling the story inaccurate, which it wasn't. Finally, days later, the two meet, and I'm quoting from the report, the president asked McGahn, did I say the word fire? McGahn responded, what you said is, call Rod, Rosen call Rod tell Rod that Mueller has conflicts and can't be the special counsel. The president responded, I never said that. The report continues. The president then asked, what about these notes? Why do you take notes? Lawyers don't take notes. I never had a lawyer who took notes. McGahn responded that he keeps notes because he is a, quote, real lawyer. And explained... <laughs> you find that funny, Jeffrey Tuman? Okay. All right. oh. Well, settle down. You get plenty of time I'm sorry. I know, but I just... It's... it's anyway, anyway, please continue. He's a real lawyer. It's your program. Uh, and explained that notes create a record and are not a bad thing. The president went on to say, I've had a lot of great lawyers like Roy Cohn. He did not take notes. He also got disbarred, if memory serves me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I knew <laughs> that is, that is correct. a kid, yes. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, didn't end well for Roy Cohn. Clearly, he, Roy Cohn uh, was no Don McGahn. In any event, this wasn't the only such incident. There's also the firing of James Comey and the bogus reason given for it at the time. So what's your response to these rank-and-file FBI agents who, who disagree with your contention that they lost faith in, in Director Cohn? Look, we've heard from uh, countless members of the FBI that say very different things. What led you in the White House to believe that uh, he had lost the confidence in the rank-and-file of the FBI when the acting director says it's exactly the opposite? Well, I can speak to my own personal experience. I've heard from countless uh, members of the FBI that are grateful and thankful for the president's decision. Turns out there weren't countless FBI agents calling up Sarah Sanders at the White House to express their relief. Sarah Sanders speaking, that was, she was speaking, by the way, on two consecutive days for countless grateful members of the FBI, allegedly, whom she pulled out of her hat. How do we know that? Because she said so under oath. Reading now from page 72 of the report, Sanders told this office that her reference to hearing from, quote, countless members of the FBI was a slip of the tongue. She also recalled that her statement in a separate press interview that rank-and-file FBI agents had lost confidence in Comey was a comment she made, quote, in the heat of the moment that was not founded on anything. 448 pages of accounts like that of meeting Russians, lying about it, of the president repeatedly answering questions with the words, I don't recall, despite claiming to have the best memory. The report clears the president of criminally conspiring with the Russians. That is incredibly important and a great thing for the country. 
not, though, of seriously questionable contact. It clearly states what the president has never fully acknowledged, that Russia interfered in the election to help him win. It speaks of 14 cases referred to other jurisdictions, some of which are detailed behind black redaction bars. It is quite an effort, and we'll get to all of it tonight.